front. Okay, I'm gonna let the intro play, but by the way, any YouTube frogs, stop it in. Um, new here, if you wanna watch the original video without my reaction, feel free to tap in on the first link in the description. If you do stick around and you enjoy your safe, feel free to drop a like and a sub. Uh, and also, if you really enjoy your safe, feel free to come over to the Twitch stream. Second link in bio. Uh, never ignore native wisdom. I'm actually really, really interested in this video. Uh, yeah, dude. Like, the other one I was, like, excited about. Uh, this one, uh, I'm really interested in the fucking, like, everything about this video. Anyways, let's get into it. One summer day, a man named John Randolph was hiking through a remote forest in Colorado when he began to smell something terrible. Intrigued, he followed the smell until it brought him to this clearing, and in the clearing, John saw what looked like an old campsite. Now, John is out in the middle of nowhere, and so the idea that somebody was camping out out here in what looked like a long-term settlement was pretty bizarre to John. And so John walked into the clearing to see what was going on, and when he turned the corner and saw the ground in the middle of the campsite, he saw something that at first he couldn't even process. It was just so horrible. Bro was dumbfounded. Fake. But eventually he realized what he was looking at was real, at which point John turned around, sprinted out of there, and began screaming for help. What? But before we get into that story, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered- Dude, hit the- <laughs> Ran around, bro. Ran away. What the fuck? Story format. And you come to the right place because that's all we do and we upload once a week so if that's of interest to you please invite the like button to go out to lunch with you but once you get there what? spend the entire time chewing as loudly as possible <laughs> with your mouth wide open also please subscribe to our channel and turn on all the notifications shit. so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads okay let's get into today's story mr ballion got drenched night of february 8th 1874 holy fuck we back in the day bro we back in the day for real chat a 65 year old man named israel swan sat around this roaring fire with a big group of men inside of this valley in western colorado the men around the fire including israel were all gold prospectors which meant they traveled the western united states looking for gold but over the past several weeks, this group of prospectors had been trapped in this valley because of all the terrible winter storms. Mm. They had these storms coming in that each time would dump up to six feet of snow. But on this particular night, as Israel sat by the fire, you know, enjoying the flames and hearing people tell stories, one of Israel's friends, one of the other gold prospectors, whose name was Alfred Packer, he Alfred Packer? <laughs> I thought it was Pecker for a second. I think I need to change my name to Pecker. Chris Pecker. <laughs> That'd be fire. Stood up and basically pitched the whole group as to why they should come with him and leave the valley right now. Basically, Alfred told the group that, you know, the weather is starting to turn a bit. It's not as bad anymore. You know, the snow's starting to melt. And Alfred said, I know a pathway out of here that will take us out of this valley in just two weeks and it'll bring us right to Breckenridge, Colorado, which was an area that was known by prospectors for having lots and lots of- Chris, you can't even pack a lunch, good luck? Yo. Sorry, that was mean. I mean, it's true. Gold. And so Alfred's basically telling them, you know, this is a win-win. We can get out of here sooner and we can get rich. After Alfred made this pitch, he sat back down and everybody just stayed quiet for a second. And Israel, he kind of looked around and watched to see if anybody would take Alfred up on his proposition. Nobody, Israel, nobody is fucking, nobody's taking him up. Everybody's just like, mm, yeah. Knew, unlike him, most of the other prospectors didn't like Alfred. They said oh. he was lazy and difficult. <laughs> but Israel felt like that was really not the reason they did not like his friend. He believed the reason other people did not like Alfred was because Alfred had epilepsy, which meant he periodically had seizures. Oh. And because he had seizures, it kind of made him- Why was my picture up there? Oh yeah, Rourke, this happened in like 1846 or some bullshit like that, bro. This is when he was born, right? <laughs> Sounds good, Austin. A liability for journeys like this, where, you know, the whole group really needs to rely on everybody and everybody needs to pull their own weight. And so they were kind of worried about a guy who at any moment could just become kind of useless because he was having a seizure. But for years. Israel, Alfred's epilepsy really didn't matter. He didn't feel like Alfred was some huge liability. 
he felt like Alfred was actually very smart. Oh, I forgot to put captions on my bad gangsters. Quite bold. And so for him to stand up and make this pitch, just kind of... Yeah, dude, Alfred got big nuts. I will say that, dude. He hung like that, bro. Omen, oh, what's up, Omi? How's it going? Felt like in keeping with who he was. He was somebody that wanted to get things done. And, you know, Israel liked that about him. However, just because Israel liked Alfred, that didn't mean he was just going to naturally go with Alfred and do his big plan. But he was at least thinking about it. And as Israel was weighing out the pros and cons of, you know, whether or not he should go with Alfred, he happened to look across the fire and he saw one of the men, this really big guy, was sitting there looking really serious and just shaking his head slowly back and forth like, no, you guys can't be considering leaving early. And then the big guy stood up and he held out his hand right in front of Alfred, basically telling him, like, don't say another word. And then this guy, while still looking at Alfred, he said, if you leave right now, all of your friends will die. And oh. then this big guy sat back down again, and then everybody around the fire just sat there, really tense for a few seconds, in total silence. Yo, what a vibe killer, bro. What the fuck? Yo, chill out, man. What the hell? When is the mod team writing scripts like this for Chris to read? Uh... You know, after I heard about um, how much fucking work teenagers did for Skydust Minecraft uh, editing and shit like that, you know what? Maybe I, maybe I will fucking get behind this a little bit. Yo, guys, somebody write me a fucking script, bruh. <laughs> she can't say long. I have to wake up super early in the morning. Or early tomorrow. Plus, I have to walk my dog. Yo, sounds good, Sorrow. Thanks for hanging. Sleep well. Have a good day tomorrow, all right? Yeah, team, yo, we got about, like, fucking, like, three motherfuckers. Didn't they write a PowerPoint? We had some, we had some quirky motherfuckers on staff at one point. <laughs> yo, what's up, Lean Drill? I hope you're doing okay, gangsta. Appreciate you stopping in. Sorry, let me center this up a little bit more. You know what, maybe it being off-center will be better because it's not super close to being center, the big but man not actually. Just spoken was not a gold prospector. He was actually very different than the rest of the people sitting around this fire. His name was Yure, and he was a Native American chief of the Tabawatch band of the Ute tribe. And Chief Yure... Oh yeah, wait, Lindbergh, did you make a PowerPoint at one point? ...had actually saved the lives of everybody, Israel and Alfred included, who was sitting around this fire. Because oh. a few weeks earlier, this whole group of gold prospectors had wound up lost in this valley, which was the valley where Chief Yure lived with his tribe, and he had found them stumbling around on the brink of death with all the snow coming down. And so Chief Yure... Well, I mean, I remember your fun little, like, arts and crafts, like, why Chris is a fucking twink bottom with danger, but I mean, like, you know... Uh, fucking mod team PowerPoints. And his people brought the prospectors some food and water. They helped them set up a campsite right near a river. And then Chief Yure told them to stay put in this campsite and ride out the winter. And then in the springtime, when the snow melts, it'll be safe for you all to leave. Now, at first, the gold prospectors were only thankful and just totally psyched that Chief Yure had found them and given them this campsite. I mean, this was great. And so they had no problem agreeing to, you know, wait until the spring to finally leave. But now, after several weeks of being kind of trapped in this camp, the whole group was really starting to get restless. They were worried if they didn't leave soon, there'd be no more gold for them to mine. And for Israel specifically, there was even more pressure on him to go out and find gold because he had told his family that this would be his last treasure hunting adventure ever. And so he really couldn't go home empty handed. He literally needed the gold in order to continue to survive and take care of his family. So when Alfred stood up and broke the kind of tense silence and said to Chief Ure, you know, thank you for your concern, but I am gonna leave early and I just hope others will- Yeah, thanks for your concern, brother. I am gonna dipski, all right? Uh... Sorry, it is an L camp here, bro. I need to go make some bands for real. If I'm trying to cop my new whip, bro, there's this new horse. His name's fucking Demarcus, brother. Okay, this horse is fucking fast as fuck, brother. I I need that dude. And he's sturdy, bro. Yeah, we fucking turning up one time. Okay, I got a dip ski. Peace out. Also, I'm trying to I'm I'm watching Mr. Bollian's eyes here. Okay. This motherfucker, I'm trying to see if if it's like his eyes do this, like he's reading a script, or if this guy really just got memory like that, dude. Will come with me 
you know, at that point, Israel saw the conviction in Alford, and Israel really felt like he did need to leave now. He needed to get that gold. And so Israel said, you know what? I'll go with you as well. And then after Israel said he would go, four other gold prospectors also volunteered to leave early with Alford. Chief Ure could tell he was not going to change any of these guys' minds. And so even though he felt like this was a terrible idea, he shifted his focus from trying to stop them to just trying to give them as much information as he could about the area they were going to go into. And so he called all the volunteers who'd be leaving early over to him, and then Chief Ure drew a map in the dirt on the ground, and he told Alfred and Israel and the other four volunteers that you have to follow the river out of here. It'll bring you to this mountain range called the San Juan Mountain Range, and you cannot attempt to yeah, and the cuts. Yeah, he definitely studies, too, for sure. I think he's just got a huge fucking brain, too. To go over those mountains. You will not make it. You got to follow that river and go around the mountain range. And then once you do, on the other side, there will be an outpost where you can stop, get supplies, rest, and then continue the rest of the way towards Breckenridge. And then after Chief Ure had explained all this, he made sure to mark an X on his dirt map exactly where the outpost would be. And then Purple! What's up, homie? I prefer the novel, by the way? Dude, fuck yeah, let me know how it is. Then Chief Ure just turned around and walked over to his horse and rode away. And then shortly after that, Alfred, Israel, and the rest of the gold prospectors also turned in for the night. The next morning, Israel, Alfred, and the other four volunteers who were going to be going on this journey, they got up early and began packing up their stuff. And as they did, one of the other gold prospectors, who had not volunteered to go with them, who would be staying in the valley until the springtime, he actually came forward and said he would help them carry their supplies as far as he could go, you know, using his horse, but at some point he would need to stop, drop off their stuff, and then they would be on their own. And so the men were very thankful about this. And so shortly after eating breakfast, they were all ready to go and they hit the trail. As Israel and the rest of the prospectors began to hike their way up and out of the valley, they began to see off in the distance the huge jagged mountains of the San Juan mountain range, but they were careful to kind of veer closer to the north to stay along that river path because they knew they were not supposed to go up and over the mountains. And as Israel trudged through the snow in a line of men, he held on to a coffee pot, a metal coffee pot that he kept hot coals inside of. This not oh. only kept his hands warm, but also if he ran out of matches, he could easily start a fire using the coals. It was an old oh. trick he had learned. And so as he's clutching this- That's actually smart as fuck, bro. That is super smart. Um, Dude, it's crazy what people used to do back in the day to be able to make money if they didn't like want to work on whatever there was. Or there might not have even been the availability to work in like towns and shit back in the day. Motherfuckers would just fucking- go and try and find fucking gold for weeks and months on end. Can you imagine that shit? And then you don't even fucking know if they're going to come back in these kind of conditions. You're just sitting there for months on end like, damn, wonder if this motherfucker going to roll back up or if he gone forever. One of my cousin's baseball game today and the sun was on my direct left and it was a double header. So I was there all day. I have sunburn, but only on the left side of my face. Oh, shit. Tragic, bro. Shit's tragic magnificent warm coffee pot in the freezing cold weather israel heard someone walking up behind him and so he turned around and he saw it was alfred and he looked totally miserable way more miserable than israel was uh and so without even thinking about it israel just handed off his warm coffee pot to alfred and alfred took it and clutched it and was obviously so thankful now none of these gold prospects w friend struck it rich they were all basically poor uh -huh. but of all these gold prospectors Alfred really had the least of all of them. And as oh. a result, Israel kind of felt protective of Alfred. And also, Alfred was half the age of Israel. Alfred was 30 years old. And so Israel kind of viewed Alfred. Israel was 60? Dude was out here turning up in the fucking snow and shit at 60? At this point in history? Weren't these motherfuckers like cooked at like 50? Huh? Were they... <laughs> nah, dude, actually, now that I think about it, they were probably living longer because they were, like, used to, like, all the fucking troubles and also didn't have, like, super processed food and other fucking problems like that. Yeah, these motherfuckers are probably living to, like, 90, 100, dude. Shit. Bird, ...as, like, a lost kid trying to find his way. Alfred had also confided in Israel that when the Civil War broke out in the United States, 
Alfred had attempted to... This wasn't the 40s, by the way. I just want to say this was... This was when, when did he say? Like 70, 80 something? Sorry, I, I forgot what time period he said. Joined the Union Army on two different occasions because he wanted to fight the slaveholding Confederate Army. But in both cases, they kicked Alfred out for his epilepsy. But that Aww. had not stopped Alfred from tattooing on his arm his battalion information and his name. And unfortunately, because Alfred could not read or write, he misspelled his name when he gave it to the tattoo artist. Me type shit, bro. My dyslexic ass type shit. Yo, what? <laughs> Why is the H missing in my fucking name, brother? Uh, that's how you spelled it? No, I didn't. Let me see. Fuck! <laughs> And so when he got the tattoo, it did not say Alfred for his first name. It said Alfred, A-L-F-E-R-D. Well, and from that point on, that was his name. Nobody called him Alfred. They called him Alfred. And so this was kind of embarrassing for him. And then after getting rejected from the military, Alfred had kind of bounced around from one job to the next, never really putting his roots down and never starting a family. And so again, you know, Israel just felt like this was a guy who needed some help. And so after Alfred very happily accepted. So he had, he couldn't read or write. He had no riz. He got epilepsy. He ain't, he ain't found shit for gold. Oh man, my dude cooked. Yeah, no, shout out, shout out our boy here for watching out for Alfred. Alfred. Did that coffee pot from Israel. He in turn reached into his jacket and pulled out a flask with some alcohol in it. And he oh. handed it to Israel, almost like a thank you for giving me this warm coffee pot. And then the two friends walked side by side for a while, you know, passing back and forth the flask and the coffee pot. And then by late afternoon that day, when the snow was really starting to come down, the prospector who had volunteered to use his horse to help move some of their supplies, he had finally reached a point where he said, you know, my horse can't go any farther, the weather's too bad. And so he dropped all their supplies and then he turned and headed back down the trail. And very likely as these men watched him disappear down the trail, they all had the same thought. I just got to suck it up for two weeks to get through this treacherous journey. And I two fucking weeks, bro. I can barely suck it up for two fucking days. My fucking, fucking, uh, whatchamacallit ass, fucking privileged ass. Be like, God damn, I got to suck it up for two fucking days on tour. Damn, I can't fucking take a dump at my own toilet for five days, bro. What the hell? Dude, what the fuck? He's probably the kindest person ever. I mean, it sounds like he's a real nice guy. Yeah, I'm fucking with that, bro. I will get to Breckenridge, and I will become rich. I will become a millionaire! Oh, uh, ad time. What we Thank got? YouTube better help for Oh, no! Oh, fuck, fuck, dude, fuck! All right, yeah, we ain't rocking with this. Uh, uh, we ain't rocking with better help. They sell our information. So with FaZe, are we just waiting on FaZe Neon now? Oh my god, bro. Holy fuck. Yes. Yes. I am I I that would literally that would uh what did Pyro Cynical say that Logan Paul gave him? That would be right in my checks, bro. By that point, I'll probably have that other channel monetized. Oh yeah, that'll be right in my check. They got Ballion! Backpedal quickly. Yeah, we skipping through that ad. Usually I'll let Mr. Ballion fucking talk about whatever, bro, but nah, not here. Nah, we we skipping. Two weeks would pass by, and Alfred, Israel, and the other four prospectors did not show up at that what? outpost that Chief Uray had pointed uh -oh. out, which was on the other side of the San Juan Mountains. That was going to be their first official stop before they continued the rest of the way to Breckenridge. And then another two weeks went by, and still they did not show up at the outpost, and they didn't show up at any of the other camps in the surrounding They're areas. They're cooked. They're now, cooked. Alfred's big plan for this group was really dependent on the weather holding up. I'm guessing the fact that I just got the recommendation that he fucking put in this video, this trail is a death trap. This did not go well. <laughs> I'm guessing this did not go according to plan. When they left, it was true that the weather was improving. It was snowing less. But within a couple of days of this group setting off on the trip, those winter storms came back with a vengeance and just dumped snow all over the valley and all across the trail this group would have been on in their attempt to leave. Which side didn't fall the, the river? People who knew that these men had embarked on this perilous journey was the men themselves and then also Chief Ure and the other gold prospectors who had decided to stay in the valley until spring. But even if Chief Ure... Wait, how do we know about the story of uh, the dude... 
Oh, wait, the guy who handed off their shit. Never mind. I was about to go, how do we know about the story about the dude fucking handing off the hot, whatchamacallit, and fucking Israel handing off to Alfred, and then Alfred handed him the alcohol. I, rem I forgot that happened before the dude left to go back to the squad. You know what I'm saying? Fuck. Ray and those other prospectors knew that Alfred, Israel, and the others were in trouble, you know, they would have no way of helping them or getting to them or even communicating to the outside world. They were completely stuck in the valley and basically couldn't do anything. And so in short, it appeared that Alfred, Israel, and the other four men were totally lost somewhere out in the wild, but nobody knew. But that would all change on April 16th, 1874. There we go. I knew it was the 70s or the 80s and the 1800s. Fuck. Roughly two months after Israel, Alfred, and the... Holy fuck, chat. That happened... How long ago did this happen? 100 and... Is it 150 years ago? Am I tripping? Did I do the math wrong? The others had begun what was supposed to be a two-week-long journey. That morning, a group of officials who manned the outpost that Israel... And Wait, I was thinking that was 90. Wait. I was thinking that was 80s. Wait, no. No, I was thinking it was 70s. Yeah, this, uh, yeah, it's 150. Sorry. I was like kissing myself. Alfred and the others were supposed to go to. They were having breakfast in one of the outpost's little log cabins. And as they're eating and talking to each other, suddenly from behind them, the door to the cabin flies open. And these officials, they turn around and they see standing in the doorway is this totally disheveled looking guy with long hair that's sticking up in the air and a huge bushy beard. What up, Alfred? And in one hand, he's got a rifle. And in the other hand, he's got a metal coffee pot. And his eyes were darting like crazy side to side. And he was clearly in shock. And he was trying to speak, but he just couldn't. This man was Alfred. And it was obvious to the officials that this man is in dire need of help. And so without even asking him any questions. Is in D need. Yo, what? YouTube auto captions? Did y'all see that? It said in D need. <laughs> what kind of D does he need, bruh? They whisked him inside, shut the door, got him some food, got him some water, and immediately Alfred's wolfing down the food as fast as he can until he began vomiting, huh? at which point he apologized profusely and said, you know, I've been starving out in the wild for weeks, and, you know, it must have done something to my intestinal tract, you know, it's probably damaged, but frankly, the officials did not care about the fact that he threw up all over the ground. They were worried this guy was going to die right then and there. And so the officials helped Alfred get cleaned up and put in warm clothes. And then Alfred asked them, you know, do you have any whiskey? I want to kind of warm my body up. And they said, no problem. They handed him some whiskey. And so Alfred threw a couple of shots back. And then after that, it was pretty obvious that Alfred had kind of relaxed a little bit. And then at that point, one of the officials asked Alfred, what happened to you? As soon as Alfred was asked this question, he shut his eyes and kind of grimaced, like even the thought of what had happened to him was just too painful to think about. But after a moment of silence, Alfred, with his eyes still closed, told the officials that he had been with five men and they were trying to hike their way out of the valley to get to Breckenridge, Colorado to look for gold. But as they were hiking this trail, this huge storm came in and made it really hard to navigate the trail they were on. And so the group decided they would actually cut through the San Juan mountain range. The thing Chief Ure said, don't do- Listen to Chief Ure, dumbass, God damn it. Do that, do not go over the mountains. They decided to do that. But as they were traversing these treacherous mountains, it was clear that Alfred was just not keeping up with the group. And so unfortunately, they made the decision to leave Alfred behind what? to die. And he what? knew he was being abandoned to die. And so he had to watch as his five friends, you know, disappeared into the snow. But amazingly, Alfred did not die. Instead, he would spend the next nearly two months stumbling through the snowy forest, having no idea where he was going, eating roots and flowers, and looking for shelter any chance he got. But the thing that really allowed him to survive out in the wild was when he was abandoned by the five others, he was in possession of that coffee pot that had the coals inside of it. And so at night, he was able to start fires. And then also yeah. at one point, he was so hungry that he cooked his leather shoes in the fire what? and ate them. What? Because again, this guy is starving. And so really, he was on the brink of death when he randomly stumbled into this outpost and found this cabin. After Alfred finished telling his story, the officials were just totally shocked and silent. And Alfred eventually would ask them a question. Dude, I think that just shows like, if you like really set your mind to surviving and like you believe it in these situations, a lot of the times you can. 
Like, there are so many stories like this of, like, yeah, there's no way this person should have survived. Like, literally, the, like, all the odds were against them. But, like, in their head, they were like, I'm going to survive. I'm going to keep pushing. I'm going to keep going. Like, as far as I can, you know, keep going. Um, They fucking pull it off. That's, like, this dude, sh there's no way this guy should have fucking survived this. Let alone, it sounds like he's the only one that survived after his fucking friends were like, all right, peace out, brother. All right, brother. Hey, brother. We'll be seeing you on the other side, brother. He would say. Special team, special players, special plays. Alfred, can you get on the special team, brother? They have any of my men come through here? Did anybody else survive? And they would say, no, it's only you. We have not seen anybody else. Now, the officials did not send out a search party right away, mostly because it seemed kind of obvious that Alfred's men were likely dead by this point. It's been two months since they started that journey. You know, the chances are just not good that they have survived. But even if these other men were not dead yet, the officials had no idea where to begin their search. They knew that if they actually wanted to go looking for these guys, they would need Alfred to lead the search because he's the only one who knows where they could be. But Alfred was not healthy enough to go out in the wild and lead a search. And so for several weeks, Alfred just stayed in the outpost, resting and recovering. And then finally, when he was healthy enough, he would go out and lead a search party to go find the missing men. But unfortunately, he couldn't find anything. And Damn. so it wasn't until that summer, when all the snow had finally melted, that the mystery was finally solved about what happened to those other men. On August 20th, 1874, a traveling artist named John Randolph was hiking through a forest in western Colorado. Dude, you gotta feel bad, because I feel like probably Alfred already had a bad go at things, and then he was the one who was like, yo, guys, we're gonna do this. Like, we're gonna fucking go through here, we're gonna find gold, we're gonna fucking pass through, like, I know a way, like, we're gonna do this. And then he is the reason that these five dudes died, you know? Roughly in the area where those other prospectors would have been walking on their attempt to leave the valley, and as John Randolph was walking through that area, he began smelling this horrible smell. And so John followed the smell until it brought him to this clearing. And then in the clearing, he's just a curious little guy. He's just trying to figure out what the fuck is going on. Cairo, what's up, homie? How's it going? The clearing was what looked like an old beat up campsite. And so being curious, John walked into the clearing to see who was in this campsite. But when he turned the corner and saw what was on the ground in the middle of this campsite, he froze. Because on the ground... Bro, hit the... the... <gasps> ...middle of this campsite were five the... dead men all lying perfectly in a row. They were the what? source of the terrible smell. And right away, Why were they even though row? John was in shock from what he's seeing, he could tell that these five men did not die from something natural. One guy was missing his head altogether, and the other four had obvious signs of something being smashed really hard, probably repeatedly, into their heads. Alfred, why would you do that, brother? What the fuck? Hello, brother. Hello, Kyra. Imagine getting abandoned and being the only one left that lived. Yeah, bro, that would be fucking insane. Skidwalker? Yeah, maybe. Maybe, bro. Maybe. Uh, the more I hear about this shit, the more I believe that, bro. You know what I'm saying? Or, like, some sort of, like, creature like that. The fact that Israel abandoned him. Yeah, dude. I mean, I guess probably Israel probably would have been the one that left him with the coals. So, at least he was like, here, fucking, like, try. You know, try and fucking make it. But we can't stay here any longer. But that wasn't all. The other thing John immediately noticed. You 100% Stardew? Fuck yeah, Joe. How's it going, brother? Hope you're enjoying Stardew is that the five bodies were in very different states of decay. Two of the bodies were basically skeletons, but the other three were not. They were basically intact. Their oh. chests had been cut and flayed open, oh. but they all looked like they had died somewhat recently. In fact, one of the men looked so lively that it seemed like he was just sleeping, despite the gaping wound in his chest and his head that clearly indicated he was dead. Now, John wanted to turn and run away. But he had this morbid curiosity. He wanted to know what he was even looking at. You know, what happened to these guys? And so, kind of against his better judgment, he walked a little bit closer to the bodies. And when he got close enough, he noticed something else that was totally off about the scene. When he was looking down at these men, he could tell that the wounds they had sustained, especially in their chest, looked surgical, like whoever had wounded them, whoever had cut them, had done so with an incredible amount of precision. Aliens. 
This was not random hacks that got these guys killed. This was like a butcher carving up meat. And then John happened to look up from these five bodies and he noticed just a little ways away was the remains of a burned out fire pit. And then there was a trail that kind of led off into the woods behind the fire. And so again, you know, John, he wants to run, but he can't Ooh. help but be really curious. Mm -hmm. And so he walked past the bodies, he went to the fire pit, and he followed that trail kind of back into the woods, and he found this ramshackle shelter kind of tucked away in the woods that was abandoned, no one was in there, but it had all the signs of someone living here for a pretty long period of time. And then suddenly, it was like all these pieces came together, and John realized what he had just stumbled on. Clearly, those five men had been murdered, and the person who murdered them very likely lived in this camp. And over the course of what looks like weeks or months, this person was butchering these men and then cooking their body parts over that fire and eating them. This is like a cannibal camp. And John, you know, he's thinking, is this guy going to come back? You know, whoever lives here, are they coming back soon? He didn't know. And so kind of in a panic, he pulled out a sketchbook, he sketched the area, and then he turned and sprinted out of there. To oh, that was his sketch. Oh, shit. Find help. It would turn out John, the illustrator, was totally correct about what he thought was happening at that camp. After Alfred was left behind to die, those five other men carried on into the night up into the mountains, and then somebody attacked them, began killing them, and eating them. And that person was Alfred. <gasps> oh, fuck! Dude, I literally said it! I literally fucking said it, bro! I literally fucking said it, bro! Oh my god, I said, God damn it, Alfred! That was why Alfred had survived for so long. It wasn't just that he was able to make fires at night, it was that he was able to make fires at night and eat his friends. Now, no one has ever been able to actually determine how Alfred went about killing these five men or even when he killed these- Prophet, no way! I had a sense, I had a sixth sense. Five men, all we know is that based on the investigation, four of his victims appeared to have been asleep when they were murdered. But the fifth victim, who actually was Israel, the one guy who really liked Alfred and looked out for him and was kind of like a father figure to him, he was the only one who showed signs of a big struggle before he was murdered. While Alfred denied killing all five of the men, he said that he basically only killed one of them and it was self-defense and somebody else killed the other four, you know, it was kind of confusing. You know, despite those claims he had, the one thing Alfred never denied was the cannibalism. In fact, Alfred straight up told authorities that he grew to really like the taste of human meat. In fact, when they searched that campsite that John Randolph found, they would find the remains of a dead deer that was right near the campsite. But despite it being right there, Alfred never attempted to carve it up and eat it. He just kept going back to his stockpile of human meat and eating that. What? In the end, Alfred was convicted of murder and he was sentenced to 40 years in prison. But in 1901, when he was 92 years old, he was granted parole, and right away, Alfred became a vegetarian, and then died a few years later. From the 1800s all the way through the 1900s, Bodmin St. Lawrence Hospital was one of the largest running asylums in all of England. But in 2002, it was permanently shut down due to so many accusations of patient mis- what? Yo, Mr. Bolling, where are we going right now? Where are we going right now, brother? I, I, I'm in shock, dude. I, I don't even know. Holy fuck, dude. Holy fuck. Dude, literally. And then he killed. And then I ate the. They use spam to help cannibals not uh want to eat humans anymore. Dude, I I was fucking around when I said, "Oh damn, Alfred, what you what'd you do that for?" Nope. Nope. Urban, what's up, bro? It's going amazing, dude. It is going absolutely amazing. This story was fucking crazy that we just watched. Spam ain't helping shit. Spam is ass. Treatment. 
Now, after it was shut down, the property kind of fell into disrepair. It was basically abandoned. Okay. And so when it became totally overgrown, it began attracting vandals and urban explorers. And so the owners of the property finally just put up a fence all the way around the hospital and they hired security guards to patrol the property at night to keep vandals out. And so these security guards began doing that and very quickly they began reporting that they were- I said I bet he, he was a nice guy. Chucky, you fucking baited me so hard and he's the nicest guy in the world. Yeah, I'm sure he's a, little, he's a nice little guy, dude. What the hell? Seeing and hearing things they couldn't explain on this property. They'd hear things like footsteps on floors that they knew were vacant, or they'd hear doors slamming, and at least one guard claimed to have seen a gurney roll into the hallway from a room, but then when he checked Aww. the room, there was nobody in there. But perhaps the scariest account came from a security guard who when he showed up for work that night, he was feeling kind of sick. And so when he was out walking the property, he found somewhere to lay down in one of the smaller hospital buildings. And as he was laying there with his eyes closed, he began hearing a tapping sound coming from outside. And so he stood up and he walked over to the window and he looked out into the night, but he couldn't see anything out there that would cause this tapping sound. And so he shrugged and turned back around to go lay down again, but, when he turned around, standing in this room with him was this skinny woman wearing a white hospital gown, and she had this grimy black hair that was covering her face, and so the security guard is just staring <gasps> at her, totally terrified, and before he could do anything, this woman just turns and walks into a wall and vanishes. To hear the full terrifying story, check out the latest episode on our newest Ballin Studios podcast called Bedtime Stories. Like, oh. This episode is called Night Shift, and if you want more episodes like this, Bedtime Stories releases new episodes every Wednesday, and they're available on all podcast platforms. So that's going to do it. If you got something out of today's story, be sure to check out our podcast called the Mr. Ballin Podcast, where we have hundreds of stories, a lot like this one, but many of them are only available on the podcast. Again, it's called the Mr. Ballin Podcast, and it's available on Amazon Music. Wait, don't go anywhere. If you're looking for more strange, dark, and mysterious videos, click here. Holy fuck. Oh, this looks like a fun react. Let me open this up. Sometimes. Shh, Mr. Balling. Dude, I have nothing to fucking say to that, bro. There is literally. There is a mountain range. In the oh, middle fuck. Of the there is literally nothing that I can fucking say. Uh. About that, bro. I, I am, story is I am fully dumbfounded by that entire fucking situation. I was like, "Oh, dude, probably feels bad. Oh, dude, probably feels bad. He got everyone killed. Uh, no. Uh, no, he doesn't feel bad. He's like, mm, my belly full, bro. My belly's full. How is he in shock, bro? What did he do that put him in shock? Oh, yeah, I cooked up my boots. Yeah, that's how I survived. Yeah, that yeah, I, I cooked up my boots. That's how I survived. Not that I ate my fucking friends, brother. What the fuck? Did I actually put one in Hogwatch? God damn it.